Germany brings in sweeping restrictions on anyone who's not been vaccinated against COVID-19, barring them from many public places. Chancellor Angela Merkel says the country needs to avoid a fourth wave of the virus and that vaccines may become compulsory next year. Britain has ordered more than a million extra doses. Boris Johnson says the deal future-proofs the country's vaccination programme. Whatever Omicron may or may not be able to, to do, it certainly will not negate the overall value of the, of the boosters. We'll have a special report from South Africa, where the Omicron variant is driving a rise in cases. Also tonight... The death of six-year-old Arthur Lavigno Hughes, who was starved and tortured. His stepmother is found guilty of murder, his father of manslaughter. The couple are condemned by the boy's grandmother. They're wicked, evil. There's no word for them, especially your own child. Nearly 20,000 people still have no electricity in Scotland and Northern England in the wake of Storm Arwen. The army is called in to help. And the Duchess of Sussex wins her privacy case against the publisher of the Mail on Sunday after it printed parts of a letter she'd written to her father. And coming up in the sport on the BBC News Channel, Manchester United's interim manager Ralph Ragnick watches on Old Trafford as they take on Arsenal in the Premier League. Hello, good evening. Germany has announced major restrictions on anyone who's not vaccinated against COVID-19, banning them from all but essential shops in an attempt to fend off a fourth wave of the virus. And the Chancellor Angela Merkel says vaccines may become compulsory from February. Here, as it emerged that a booster jab may be needed every year, the government confirmed it's ordered 114 million more doses from Pfizer and Moderna. The deal allowed for vaccines to be modified to tackle new variants if necessary. Cases of Omicron have now been confirmed in 24 countries. Another 10 cases were reported in the UK today, taking the total to 42. Here's our medical editor, Fergus Walsh. Red alert in Germany. Intensive care staff at this Bavarian hospital lit the wards red to warn Germans of the threat from Covid amid its worst wave of infection so far. The government has announced a ban on the unvaccinated entering bars, restaurants and non-essential shops. This is the situation we are confronted with, and it's also clear what we need to achieve first. Those who have not been vaccinated yet need to do so. And they could go further, with plans for vaccination to be made mandatory as early as February next year. Germany's wave is being driven by the Delta variant, but Omicron is continuing to spread globally, with cases confirmed in more countries, including India and France. Here, Omicron and any future variants will be combated with yet more boosters, year after year if needed. All these jabs will be so-called mRNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna. But the focus right now is getting this round of boosters in arms. The Prime Minister had his at the hospital that saved his life last year. St Thomas's in London, where he was admitted to intensive care with COVID. Whatever Omicron may or may not be able to, to do, it certainly will not negate the overall value of the, of the boosters. So everybody should get your your booster as soon as you'll call forward. Pfizer, like the other vaccine makers, is already working on an Omicron-specific COVID vaccine, which could be ready in three months. Hi, Mr. Buller. Hello, hello. Welcome. How are you? In a rare interview, the boss of Pfizer told me he thought regular boosters would be needed. If we have to make a guess, based on everything I have seen so far, I would say that likely will be needed annual revaccinations to maintain very robust and very, very high level of protection. In the United States, 
Five to 11 year olds are now being immunized against COVID. You want to give Bailey a treat? Therapy dogs okay. providing a useful distraction. A decision on this age group in the UK may come before Christmas. They'd receive a third of a standard dose. It all means bigger and bigger profits for Pfizer. Revenues from its vaccine will exceed 26 billion pounds this year. What would you say to those who regard it as immoral to cash in during a pandemic? I believe that uh, we have saved the global economy trillions of dollars. I think it's a strong incentive for innovation for the next pandemic that people will see that if they stepped up to the game to bring something that saves lives, that saves money, there is also financial reward. Meanwhile, the UK has approved a new antibody drug which dramatically cuts the risk of severe illness. Initial tests suggest it will work against Omicron. It's not just vaccines, but treatments which will end this pandemic. Fergus Walsh, BBC News. South Africa, which recorded some of the earliest cases of Omicron, is seeing a major increase in cases. Over the last week, the daily number of new COVID infections has increased fourfold, from less than 3,000 to more than 11,500, three quarters of which are Omicron. So far, hospital admissions remain low and symptoms of the new variant are reported to be mild. But early figures suggest an increase in the number of people who've had the virus becoming reinfected. Our Africa correspondent, Andrew Harding, has more. It's summertime here in South Africa, but a shadow looms over the beaches and holiday season. A fourth wave of COVID infections is spreading fast, driven by the new variant. Are you worried about this new variant, Omicron? The, uh, the new one? Yeah, I'm worried. I'm worried. We don't know what the new variant's like. So what the symptoms are. Exactly. How, how we don't know how it are. would affect us now, um, and it makes you really scared. At their laboratory here in Durban, the scientists who first identified the Omicron variant are racing to unlock its secrets. And now, the first hints are emerging of what the mutations on the virus mean. I think the epidemiological evidence is that we think it's more trans, more, you're more likely to get reinfected if you had COVID before. So that is because of the mutations on the spike protein. Um, we don't know much about transmissibility, but I think looking at the mutational formation, we think it may be more transmissible than even Delta. In terms of clinical problems, uh, we have no evidence that this is a more severe uh, virus than, than, let's say, Delta, Alpha or even Beta. That bears repeating. Although hospital admissions are rising sharply here, it won't be at all clear, at least for another week or two, whether the Omicron variant is more severe, more dangerous. In the meantime, above all in rural South Africa, another problem lurks. Vaccine hesitancy. This builder tells a visiting health worker that he won't get a jab, even with the new wave of infections. Do you find it frustrating, all these people saying no? It is, no? it is. It's very frustrating because we believe that if all of us have already have vaccinated, we, be, we will be safe. As this virus spreads fast now across South Africa, the real problem here is not a lack of vaccines, it's the fact that younger people seem very reluctant to get a jab, which is where these activists come in. Willing to go in. Trying to persuade the public in a country where so far only a third of adults are fully vaccinated. The guy said they would like to go and take their vaccination after we had a talk. Success. That's a success, and we thank them by clapping hands. One small victory, but South Africa has a fight on its hands. Andrew Harding, BBC News, Durban. Here, businesses have been calling for greater clarity from the government about whether people should go to Christmas parties as restaurants and hotels report customers cancelling reservations. The Prime Minister insisted this afternoon that events should go ahead. So what are people and bosses meant to do? Our consumer affairs correspondent Coletta Smith has been talking to party goers and planners. The party season is in full swing and staff from this company have come out in force. 
we give everybody the choice whether they wanted to carry on in the UK. They've all decided to, to come, um, which we're absolutely delighted about. And then we've got this, and then we're out for a nice meal this evening. The drinks, the dips and the darts are all helping conversations flow. We haven't been together for, what, over a year, really, as a company. Yeah. So really important, yeah, really good. Last week when we had all the new rules with COVID, I thought it's going to get cancelled, but yeah, I've been lucky enough to still go ahead, which has been great. They have had a few cancellations here at this darts bar in the last few days, but are hoping last-minute walk-ins will fill those gaps. At the moment, we're seeing mostly groups of around 50. Um, some of the biggest we have are around 100 for this Christmas. We have seen some bigger ones previously. Um, but I'm not sure if it's a case of splitting down into departments and coming in smaller groups or them not having the party in the first place. The government haven't changed any of the rules around meeting in big groups. It's up to individual companies to decide whether or not they want to go ahead, but some firms are taking small steps to try and mitigate that risk, making people do lateral flow tests, perhaps meeting in smaller groups, in better ventilated venues, just to try and make everyone feel more comfortable. I think it is scary with the masks, you know, coming back in, but I don't think it should affect Christmas doers now. Yeah. I mean, you're working with each other anyway, so you're going to be in proximity. I think it's very important, especially in jobs where you actually work remotely anyway. So when you're looking forward to getting together, it's one thing that everyone's looking forward to, aren't they, for the whole year, so yeah. We've been here since 4 a.m. this morning, loading in all the lighting, the sound, all the equipment, and then all like the props. The Holly organises Christmas dues at the other end of the scale, massive ones for big global brands. There'll be 300 people on this dance floor tonight. They're at the point where everything's organised and booked, they don't want to cancel, so we're doing another event today for 100 people, a conference and a party. We'll be doing small private dinings for like 20 people. Like, they were, just people want to be together and they want the Christmas dinner and the crackers and everything, don't they? With just over three weeks to go until the big day, plenty of companies are taking a punt on a safe and successful night out. Coletta Smith, BBC News in Manchester. Well, let's take a look at the latest coronavirus figures in the UK. They show there were nearly 54,000 new infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period. That's the highest since July. 141 deaths were recorded. That's someone who's died within 28 days of a positive COVID-19 test. And in terms of the vaccination programme, just over 19 million people have now had their booster jab. Now, the rest of the day's news. And a woman has been convicted of murdering her six-year-old stepson last year. And the boy's father has been found guilty of his manslaughter. As the UK was in lockdown, Arthur Lavigneau Hughes was starved, tortured and neglected by Emma Tustin and Thomas Hughes before dying of a head injury last June. During the trial at Coventry Crown Court, the couple were described as utterly ruthless and pitiless. An independent review is underway into the actions of social workers who'd visited the family two months before Arthur died. I must warn you that this report from Phil Mackey contains video and audio recordings of Arthur, which were played in the court as evidence. And the footage is distressing. Arthur Labinho Hughes had been a healthy and happy little boy, but he was subjected to months of beatings and punishments by his stepmother Emma Tustin and father Thomas Hughes. I tried to clean my six year old stepson, he's fallen, he's banged his head. Okay. And while he was on the floor, he's banged his head another five times. Tustin lied when she dialed 999, and when the police arrived, she continued trying to say that Arthur's injuries were self inflicted. So you come in, he's banged his head three or yeah, four I was times in the room, here. I was in the kitchen, then I'd sat down in the living room and you that's when he threw himself on the floor. And you heard him banging heard his, him head. Bang his head. But evidence of the cruelty was undeniable. The pair had filmed some of his suffering. On the day Arthur died, he'd been forced to sleep on the floor without a mattress. He was so weak, he could barely stand or walk. And there were recordings played in court of Arthur in obvious distress. I think they are cold, calculating, systematic torturers of a defenceless little boy. They're wicked, evil. There's no word for them, especially your own child. 
In court, Tustin and Hughes blamed each other for what was described as systematic cruelty, but it was clear both were involved. It's been a really difficult and emotional case to have to deal with, but a really important one because ultimately I just wanted to make sure that there was justice for Arthur and his wider family. Arthur had already had a difficult start in life. His birth mother, Olivia Labino Halcrow, is in prison after being convicted of manslaughter in another case. Arthur had gone to live in Tustin's house at the start of the first lockdown last year, and that's when the abuse escalated. Soon afterwards, Arthur's other grandmother, Joanne Hughes, took this photo, but social workers who investigated said it had appeared to be a happy household. An investigation is being carried out to see whether opportunities to save the little boy were missed. During the two-month trial, jurors heard hundreds of recordings and saw hours of footage far more distressing than anything we've been able to show. And at the end of the case, once the defendants had been taken down, they passed a note to the judge asking for a minute's silence in memory of Arthur. Everybody in court stood and observed it. Tustin and Hughes will be sentenced tomorrow. Sadly, whatever lessons are learned from the case will come too late to save Arthur. Phil Mackey, BBC News, Coventry Crown Court. Thousands of people are facing a seventh night without electricity after Storm Arwen brought down power lines across the north of England and Scotland. More than 100 soldiers were deployed to help in Aberdeenshire and late this afternoon Durham declared a serious emergency and called on the government to send troops there as well. Fiona Trott reports. The power of Storm Arwen. Pylons in Cumbria still lying on the ground six days on. Repairing them is a massive task. The scale of devastation is probably something that we've never really experienced. Um, definitely not in the uh, 15 years that I've worked in the organisation. To get a comparison, we'd have to go back to the Great Storm of 87. We've had over 900 instances of damage on our network. And when you look here, this is one instance of damage where you've got 18 spans to, um, to repair. The Venner family can't wait for repairs. They have five children, three are disabled, and five-year-old Oliver relies on specialist equipment. They're all crammed into hotel rooms in Newcastle. It's warm, but it's difficult. It's just been a living nightmare. It just feels like something out like of a disaster movie, you know, having all that massive storm, up, like literally up to 100 mile an hour winds, and then the aftermath, no, <laughs> just want to go home. In County Durham, hot food for people who haven't cooked for almost a week. A major incident has been declared. We've been out of power since last Friday. We're still out of power for another four days that we know of, so it'll be well over a week. Now the emergency has been escalated, they hope more money will come from central government and the army will follow. That's already happening here in Scotland. Over 130 soldiers providing logistical support in Aberdeenshire. But for now, it's an army of volunteers supporting the emergency services in Cumbria. At the end of these phones, people like the Red Cross and Mountain Rescue Services have been responding to over 600 calls from the community. It's villages like Witherslack where those responders are coming to. Some have power, some don't, and it's their seventh night in the cold. And the question they're asking is this, how do you define a major incident to get more support? As the days and the nights go on, they're becoming more angry and more anxious. Fiona Trott, BBC News, Cumbria. The oil giant Shell has tonight pulled out of a controversial North Sea oil field development. The company had a 30% stake in the Cambo field off the west coast of Shetland, which has faced sustained criticism from environmental groups. Our climate editor, Justin Rolat, is with me. So what's behind Shell's decision, Justin? Well, Shell says that after what it describes as comprehensive screening, it's decided that the, the economic case for Cambo doesn't justify it going ahead. It also said it was worried about delays with the project, and it certainly was becoming really controversial. Um, opposition to Cambo had become a focus in the run-up to the uh, the Glasgow Climate Conference. Um, activists argue that opening new oil fields that would last 25 years was not compatible with the UK's low carbon objectives. Um, so this had become a really serious reputational issue for Shell. But let's be clear: the Cambo oil field has hundreds of millions of barrels of oil, which, as of today, are worth 
$70 a barrel. Um, and other less high profile companies are not as likely to be as uh, likely to be as squeamish as Shell. So this project is not dead in the water yet. Mm. All right. Justin Rowlett, thank you. The polls have just closed in the old Bexley and Sidcup by-election. The seat fell vacant after the death of the Conservative MP and former Cabinet Minister James Brokenshire. He had a majority of nearly 19,000 when the South East London seat was contested in 2019. The result is expected in the early hours of tomorrow morning. At Ghislaine Maxwell's trial on sex trafficking charges, a former housekeeper for Jeffrey Epstein has testified that Ghislaine Maxwell was the lady of the house at Epstein's Palm Beach estate. Juan Alessi, who is 71 and worked for Epstein for 11 years, told the court he'd picked up one of Maxwell's alleged victims, who's given evidence under the pseudonym Jane, and the accuser Virginia Roberts, and that he took them to Epstein's estate when they appeared to be about 14 or 15 years old. Ghislaine Maxwell denies all the charges against her. The Duchess of Sussex has won her legal fight against the publisher of The Mail on Sunday after it printed extracts from a letter she'd written to her father uh, around the time of her wedding to Prince Harry. The attempt by Associated Newspapers to have a trial in the privacy and copyright case was rejected by the Court of Appeal. This report from our royal correspondent Nicholas Witchell contains flashing images from the start. Once again, a very clear victory for the Duchess of Sussex in her battle, in which she's been strongly backed by her husband, against the tabloid media. At the heart of this case is the publication by the Mail on Sunday of lengthy extracts from a letter the Duchess had written to her father three months after her wedding. At the time, relations between Meghan and her father were difficult. Earlier this year, a judge at the High Court in London decided the breach of privacy was so clear-cut there was no need for a full trial. The Mail on Sunday's publishers appealed against that ruling. Today, three judges in the Court of Appeal found that the original judge's decision was correct. The judge's careful decision, mostly on factual questions, was upheld. And it was hard to see what evidence could have been adduced at trial that would have altered that situation. The judges found that disclosures by Jason Knauf, Meghan's former communications advisor, that she'd written the letter knowing it might be leaked and that she'd asked him to brief the authors of a book, were irrelevant. Within minutes, a statement was issued from Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex. She said... This is a victory not just for me, but for anyone who has ever felt scared to stand up for what's right. While this win is precedent-setting, what matters most is that we are now collectively brave enough to reshape a tabloid industry that conditions people to be cruel and profits from the lies and pain that they create. Associated Newspapers, the publishers of the Mail on Sunday, said they were very disappointed by the Court of Appeal's decision. It is our strong view, they said in a statement, that judgment should be given only on the basis of evidence tested at trial. No evidence has been tested under cross-examination. Associated newspapers say they are now considering an appeal to the Supreme Court. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News. In Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo, taxis are a popular but dangerous way to get around, with as many as five kidnappings a week and women particularly vulnerable. Victoria Rubadiri, who is this year's winner of the BBC's Comla Dumour Award, given annually to an African journalist, reports now on a tech solution which two women have produced and which could now be expanded to other cities. Kinshasa one of Africa's mega cities is built on the banks of the Congo River. It has an estimated population of 15 million people. Everybody is on the move, but the transport system cannot cope. Unless you have your own set of wheels, the only way to get around is in one of these taxis. But after sunset, you run the risk of getting kidnapped. And that's been happening here up to five times a week. This route is where they usually carry out their operations. Sarah was taken while on her way home from work. 
Someone came from the back of the car. He grabbed me and said, don't move or you will die. Not every kidnapping ends in a ransom demand. They took the bag like this. In some cases, passengers are stripped of their valuables and dumped in a dangerous part of the city. After deciding not to kill her, the kidnappers left Sarah here. It's the first time she's been back at night. I really don't like this place. It reminds me of what happened here on that day. That image is still so fresh in my mind. Whenever I'm in a taxi or a bus and I see the driver turn in this direction, I get flashbacks to that night. Sarah's kidnapping happened a year ago. At the same time, two entrepreneurs launched an app called Hoja. It's a growing database of drivers and their vehicles. When I heard that people are getting kidnapped, even one of my cousins get kidnapped in the taxi, I was like, okay, I have a mission. How can we find a solution and, and uh, bring safe, sustainable, affordable mobility to the population? The app also had to be very user-friendly so that people could actually use the, the icons even when they couldn't read. All right, so this is how it works. Pretty simple. Open up the app on my phone. Just hit the QR code scanner. Bring it up to the QR code. And in a few seconds, up comes the picture of the driver and the car. And you're ready to ride. That's it. Transport officials told us that in Kinshasa, kidnappings are now down from five a week to just five in the last 10 months. And nearly a third of the city's 60,000 taxi drivers have signed up. Good for business because you know at the end of the day your, 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 your car or your taxi is safe and uh, even the passengers in, in the car or in the taxi are safe as well. Now, Hodges' overall success means there is the possibility of launching the app in other African cities. Until then, thousands of passengers still face a terrifying daily commute. Victoria Rubadiri, BBC News, Kinshasa. And that is it from the News at 10 team for this evening. On BBC One now, it's time for the news wherever you are. Have a very good night. Bye-bye.